Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave, and today we're building the ultimate rock, paper, scissors. Our rock, paper, scissors application will look great on mobile devices. It will feature animations. It will have persistent data that keeps track of the all-time scores with the competition between you and the computer. And it will also feature accessibility features and considerations throughout the design of the application. So let's get started. We're going to build the foundation for our application in HTML and then of course style it with CSS and make it functional with JavaScript. But we have to start with that good foundation. You can see the completed application here on the right in mobile view, and I always design for mobile first as it's easier to start small and make your application fit larger screens than it is to start large and squeeze your application into smaller screens. So we'll start small. In the left-hand side of Visual Studio Code, I'm going to create a folder named dist, which is short for distribution. And that is where our final code will be, and that is where we will create the HTML today. I'm going to start with the index.html file right inside the dist folder. And from there, I'm going to hide the file tree for just a little bit, and I'll press Control B as in boy to hide that. So we just have a little more room to type. And I'll start by typing an exclamation mark, which is an Emmet abbreviation and pressing enter, and then we get the outline or the skeleton for a basic web page that quickly. Now I'm also going to press Alt Z, as in zebra, and that will get the lines of code to wrap that are still too long, like this viewport line here, our meta name viewport. And from here, I'm going to change the document name to rock, paper, scissors. And then inside the head section, we'll have a few other links. Now we haven't created the CSS or JavaScript yet, so I won't link to those. But in the browser, I've got Chrome here on the right, I've got another tab open and I'm at fonts.google.com. And I'm going to search for the Montserrat font. Once you find that, go ahead and click on Montserrat. And I'm going to scroll down until I see a font weight of about 600. Here we've got semi-bold 600. Let's try that. Select this style. And here is the link. So we can just copy this part of it. And with a control C, I've copied that. And I'm going to paste that right underneath the title in the HTML and Control S will save our HTML. I'm also using the Prettier extension, so if you go to the Extensions uh, icon in Visual Studio Code and search for Prettier, you can install that if you want to, but sometimes when you see me save a file, you will see it automatically get formatted, and that's what just happened there. Okay, now that we've got Montserrat pulled in from Google Fonts, we can come back to our application and begin on the rest. Now you can see we've got a body element here, and from there I want to start with a main element. And for HTML elements, I will always stick with semantic elements when possible instead of using divs that are not semantic. Inside the main area, and we can see this in the application, we have our H1 heading here for the application, and then we have sections. We have the scoreboard section, we have the gameplay section, and really this is the player's game board and this is the computer's game board here. And so our HTML will kind of break out like that too in the different sections. So we'll start with an H1 element, and I'm going to give this a class equal to center, and we'll define the classes later as we style the application. I'm going to give this a tab index of zero, meaning that you can focus on the heading element, the H1 rock, paper, scissors, and when you tab through the application, you'll be able to stop on rock, paper, scissors, and that will let a screen reader read that if we want to, or if we want to focus on it. From there, I'm going to go ahead and type rock, paper, scissors, and that is our H1 element right here at the top. Underneath the H1 element, I'm going to provide a link that will not be visible until it has focus, at least after we style it, it will be visible for now. 
and we're going to link this to a certain part of the page. I'll put P1MSG, and that stands for Player One Message, and that's what this will link to. And then the class will equal skip dash link. And this is for accessibility. When uh, someone with a screen reader is playing, they might not want to have to tab through the scoreboard every time. So we're going to allow them to skip the scoreboard. And that's exactly what this will say. Skip scoreboard. And the link will only be visible when it is tabbed to and focused upon, when we're finished styling it. For now, of course, all the HTML will be visible if we were to view the page. Now it is time for a section, and we'll give this section an ID of scoreboard, and we'll give it a class of scoreboard. So you can tell this will be the parent element for the entire scoreboard area. Now let's go ahead and create the other areas we're going to have too, and then we'll fill them in. So after that section, we'll have a, another section with an ID equal to player board, and I need that to have a capital B. And we'll give it a class equal to player board also. And after that section, we'll have one called computer board. And that will have an ID equal to computer board and a class equal to computer board. I'm going to scroll just a little as there will be one element between the main element and the body, and this will be a form. It won't have an ID or a class, but inside the form will be a button, and the ID of the button will be play again. I'm using camel case with the capital A there. The type of the button will be a submit button, and the class will be play again, and another class of hidden. And then for the text, we'll just have play again, but we want a space there with a question mark. And that will, of course, launch the game again once the game has completed. So we'll save that, and now let's scroll back up to the scoreboard section, and we'll start to complete that section. The first thing we want to do is now we have an H1 for the page or for the application right here. And so that should be the only H1 on the page. But we want an H2 element for each section. But I'm going to give this a class of off screen. As a screen reader, we'll be able to read it, but we don't need to see it on the page. And we'll just call it scoreboard. After this H2 class, we're going to create a nested section. And this will be an ID equal to all underscore time. And that will have a class equal to scoreboard, two underscores, and section. And that is, I am loosely using the block element modifier naming convention there as I use the two underscores from scoreboard to section. And inside this section, we'll have an H3, as now you can see the hierarchy of the headers. So an H1 for the page, and then every section underneath that would get an H2. But if it's a nested section inside a section that has an H2, then it gets an H3. And this H3 is also going to have a class equal to off screen. We won't see it, but it will be available to a screen reader. And this will say all time scoreboard. Now after the H3, we're going to have a div this point and the class will equal scoreboard two underscores and header. Oh, and after that, I'm not ready to close the element yet. We'll have an aria-hidden attribute. I'm going to set that equal to true. So this will be hidden from the screen reader because it would be a little redundant. Now inside this div, we're going to have a few things as well. And the first will be a paragraph, and then we'll have an abbreviation element. You don't see these as often, but it means that the actual text that's shown on the screen is abbreviated, but we can provide the full text in a title attribute. And this will just say player one, and then the full text will be just, or the, the text seen on the page will just be P1, as it's abbreviated, not exclamation mark, but one. There we go. 
And then we'll have another paragraph element and it will say all time. And you can see where we are here. We're P1 and then all time. And so the last paragraph element will have another abbreviation and the title will equal computer player. And then we'll have the CP and then we close out the abbreviation element and we close out the paragraph. I'd like to make this just a little wider if I could. There we go. We've created the all time header, but now we have the row with the actual score in it. So after this div, underneath we'll create another div and this will have a class equal to scoreboard two underscores and row and it will have a role attribute equal to row. Underneath that, we'll have a div with an ID equal to p1 underscore all underscore time underscore score. And then the class will equal scoreboard two underscores score and another class of center. Then we'll give a role equal to cell. So we had the row as the parent and now this is a cell in the row. And then after the role attribute, we'll have an aria dash label attribute. And this is what a screen reader would read. And here it will say, player one all time wins. So we can be a little more verbose with the uh, aria label screen reader attribute. And finally, we'll provide a tab index so you can actually tab through and read the scores. And then inside the div, we'll provide the score and we'll start out with a zero. And we can save that. I'm going to scroll up for some room and to save some time, I'm just going to copy what we just did for player one, because that's one of the cells. And now we have the computer score and we can just rename this. Instead of P1 all time score, will be CP for computer player, all time score. Scoreboard score and center are the same classes. Cell would be the same role. Instead of player one all time wins, this would be computer player all time wins. And it'll still have a tab index of zero and it will have a score of zero. Okay, again, in the interest of saving some time, Instead of retyping everything now, we can just copy this nested section that has the all-time scoreboard section. And it looks like it stops here on line 37. I'll press Control C to copy all of that. And right underneath, we will paste it. And when we can just change this scoreboard to the session scoreboard. So instead of all time as the ID here, we'll change this to session. It will still be a scoreboard section, still off screen, but instead of the all time scoreboard, it is now the session scoreboard. After that, we still have a scoreboard header with the ARIA uh, attribute, ARIA hidden attribute set to true. And then we'll still have player one, but when we won't have all time, this will again say session. And then we'll still have the computer player as before. And now we're down to the scoreboard row with the role of row. That should be the same. Instead of player one all time score now, we should have player one session score. And then scoreboard score and center would still be the same classes. The role of cell would still be the same. Instead of player one all time wins, it will be player one session wins, or we could say player one wins this session. Let's tell you that just to be a little more verbose there. And the tab index of zero, so we could tab through. Again, computer player, instead of all time score, it will be session score. Scoreboard underscore score and center are still the classes. The role is still cell. The ARIA label will be player, computer player. Instead of all time wins, we said wins this session and we'll still have a tab index of zero and a score of zero to start out and we can save that and we have entered both scoreboards now.
With both scoreboards complete, as far as the HTML goes, I'm going to press Control B, or Control, yes, Control B, as in boy, once again, to show the file tree, and we need to create a folder inside of our dist folder, and let's just name this folder IMG for images. Inside the images folder, I'm going to paste three images, and I will have these files in my GitHub repository that's linked to in the description, but it's for our rock, paper, and scissors. And now we can link to these images as well. So now back in our code, I'll press Control B to hide that file tree again. We can scroll up and begin work on the player board and the computer board. For the player board, we once again start with an H2, and the H2 is going to have an ID equal to P1MSG, which stands for player one message. We'll give this a class of center. We'll give an aria-label equal to player one chooses, which is very similar to what we'll actually show in the text. Oh, we're gonna have a tab index of zero, but the player one chooses text that shows on the screen also has these ellipses after which we don't really need the screen reader to read the ellipses so we can use the aria label that just says player one chooses and that's the end of the h2 underneath that now we can begin with a div and an id equal to game board and then a class equal to game board and inside this game board now, and this is the player game board that we see right here with rock, paper, and scissors, we can begin to provide those. So we'll have a div with an ID equal to rock and a class equal to game board, two underscores, and square. Now inside this div is where we'll place the images. So we have image and then the source it's going to be equal to, and now you see Visual Studio Code instantly provides what we have available to us, which one is the image folder. And from there, we'll choose the rock. Now, after we have linked to that, we can provide alt text for that. And the alt says select rock. And then a tab index equal to zero once again, because we want to be able to play the game with a keyboard and tab through the selections. Okay, after that div, we could go ahead and copy and paste it in twice, and now we can just change what is important here. So we have paper, and of course, the image is paper, and we'll say select paper. Now on the third one, in Visual Studio Code, after you select one word, you can press Control D, and then notice it selects the second rock, and I'll press Control D again, and it selects the third. Now I'll just type scissors, and it changes all three of those. And that is an easy way to update that. And we've finished the game board for the player. Now I'm going to select everything from the H2 to the closing div, so everything inside the section of the player board and press Control C to copy. Scroll up and inside the computer board, I'm going to paste. And then we can just make some changes. Instead of P1 message, we'll have CP message for computer player. And here we can say the computer. We don't even need the one. We can just say the computer chooses. And we'll need to change the same here. Computer chooses. Then we have game board, but this needs to be CP underscore game board. And that would be the same for the class. Oh, no, the class, I'm, apologies. The class will just remain as game board. So we can apply the same class to both. But here we'll be specific that is for an ID that this is the computer game board. Okay, then when we get to rock, paper, and scissors, we can't have the same ID uh, twice on a page. So we need to, once again, say CP rock, CP paper, CP, and of course, underscore after each of those scissors. And then it is a game board square class. We'll use the same image for rock. And let's make the, the alternate text here for the image, just rock, 
paper and scissors as we're not telling the player to select any one of these. These are the computer choices that we see at the bottom. And after that, we've really completed the section, so we'll save that as well. And not only the section, with that we have completed the HTML for the project. Using the live server extension, we can look at the HTML we've completed, although it won't look great at this point, we haven't styled anything. But let's search for live server here in Visual Studio Code, and I've clicked the extensions icon on the left. And once you find live server by Ritwick Day, click that. And if you don't have it installed, go ahead and install it now. This is what we will use to preview our project. Once I close this and I show the file tree again, in Visual Studio Code, you can just right click on your HTML and choose Open with Live Server. And now you can see our completed HTML that has not been styled in any way, has no CSS or JavaScript applied, but there are the images and all of the text and even the button we supplied at the very bottom. So now we need to go ahead and style our application with CSS and we need to make it interactive with JavaScript. Before we begin to style our page, in Chrome I'm going to press Control Shift and I to go to DevTools mode and that way uh, we're designing for a small screen again, and I'm using an iPhone 5, which is essentially the smallest screen, and it's much easier to scale up to those larger phone screens. So right now this looks huge, and it definitely needs styled. Now in Visual Studio Code, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unexpand the or hide the images here so we get a little more room we're not going to be in the dist folder at first although we will have a css folder inside the dist folder but what i'm going to do is use scss and if you haven't used that it will save you time it is a great tool to use to create your css and what i want to do is use an extension and this extension is also a live extension. It's called Live SAS Compiler. And you do not want the one by Ritwick Day, although uh, he originally created this extension and did a great job. But the new version that is being maintained is by Glenn Marks. So find the Live SAS Compiler by Glenn Marks. Go ahead and install that. It does a great job and what it will do is create the minified CSS that we want. And that way we'll link to CSS, but we can write SAS and take advantage of some of the uh, nice features that save us time that SAS has to offer. Once you have this extension installed, I'm going to suggest then that you go to edit and I believe maybe it's file. Go to the file menu in Visual Studio Code select Preferences, and then click Settings. And from here you can type in SAS, and we'll see some different settings here in Visual Studio Code. What I hope we could find is this Edit in Settings.json. And here we can choose where we show some things. I'm going to expand Visual Studio Code for now, just so we can see everything over here. And we're in this uh, live SAS compile settings, but let's scroll up just a little bit. What we really want to find is live SAS compile dot settings dot format. So once you have that settings dot JSON open from your settings, here are my settings. I've chosen compressed, and then the extension name, instead of just CSS, will be .min.css. Compressed means it will minify the file, and then putting the extension of .min.css is the standard way of letting everybody know the file is minified. And then the save path is available, and you can see I'm saving to my dist folder and then a CSS folder inside the dist folder. So make sure you have those settings for your Live SAS Compiler extension under Live SAS Compile .settings .format. Okay, with that said, I'll close out of the settings, close out of the compiler install screen. And if you have that now installed outside of the dist folder, let's create a folder named SAS. 
inside this folder, let's create a file named main.scss, which is really what we'll be using, even though we say sass. There's two different variations. There's sass and scss, and today we'll use scss. And we're going to base our styles today on what is called the seven to one architecture or design pattern. And you could look that up for SAS or SCSS. There's several articles, but it is all based on dividing your styles into the different areas that are applied. But we don't really have all seven different areas. We'll only have four today. So with the SAS folder selected, let's create some other folders within. One is abstracts and then Another folder we'll create is called base. Another, oh, and I accidentally created it inside the abstracts. You do not want the folders inside of each other, just abstracts and base inside of the SAS folder. And then a third folder is components. And the fourth folder that we will use today is called layout. And with those four created, the three we're leaving out of the seven are themes, pages, and vendors. We do not need those. We only have one page. We have no vendors and no specific themes we are using. So we're using abstracts, base, components, and layout. And then we bring it all together in our main file. Okay, in the abstracts folder, so highlight that, we're going to create a couple of files. And we'll start these partials. These, all of these files will be called partials now that we pull back into the main. We start with an underscore and we'll create one called colors.scss. And while we're here, we'll go ahead and create the second file and it is underscore mixins.scss. Starting with our colors file, we'll just define a couple of variables that will hold our colors. So we start with a dollar sign and this allows us to create a variable and then we put in the color we want to use. And so this is a variation of a black color. It's a little bit of a flat black or has a little bit of a blue hue to it, to, at least to my eyes. And then this text dash color variable and we'll just set this equal to white and save and we're finished with our colors file. Moving on to mixins, this is something that SAS allows you to define and then refer to later, which will save you time. So we start with at, the at symbol, and mixin. Then I'll create one here called flex center. Inside this, we'll say display flex, justify content center, and then align items center. And then in the future, instead of having to type all three of these lines every time we want to do this, we'll just refer to flex center and it will be applied. And that is the beauty of using mixins. And then we can also do that for media queries, which is great because they always have us type a little more out. So here we'll just define this MQ mixin that allows us to pass in a size parameter. And now inside of this, this is the only time we'll have to type the media query. So we put at media only, screen and then we'll set a min dash width equal to the size passed in and then we just say at content and our mixin is defined. Now I'm going to type one more media query that's a little more specific so I'm going to call this mq min w max h so I'm setting a min width and a max height so I'm typing in or passing in two parameters here, size one and size two. And then I'll say at media only screen and min width is size one and max dash height is size two. And once again, inside of that, we just type at content and we're finished with our mixins. Now, so far we wouldn't really see anything applied yet to our page, but let's go ahead and move the window back to a, a size where we can see our HTML over in the DevTools window. And we'll go ahead and add our base mixin now, or not mixin, our base partial. There we go, create that file. It starts with underscore and then base.scss. Now we'll start to see some changes if 
we pull it into the main and then link to it from the HTML. So let's do that as well. So we do that by importing, we use at import. And I should say that there is a new way to do this in, an, in the newest version of SAS and SCSS. And I'm still using the older version because it's what I'm used to. But if you're interested in the new way to do this, please look that up as well. Here, I've got abstracts slash colors that I'm importing. And then I'm also importing in abstracts slash mixins. And then I'm going to import in the base and then the file is base. And notice we don't have to put the file extension or the underscore. We're just able to import as is there. And we have these files already. But what we haven't got is anything created for CSS. We're not using the uh, Live SAS compiler extension yet. We have to launch that and we have to link to it in our HTML. So the first thing we want to do is start up our compiler. And if you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you should have a watch SAS button here. I'm not sure if I right click, if it's available here or not. I don't see it here. So you want to find it here in the bottom where it says watch SAS. I believe you could also launch it in a toolbar. But this is what I usually do, a button down here at the bottom. And we'll just click that. And it says it is now watching. And if it's watching, it should have created the CSS folder for us. So let's open up the dist folder. And yes, I've got a CSS folder now, and it has a main.min.css. It also has a main.min.css.map file that we don't really need, but I didn't tell it not to make it, and that's fine. Uh, so main.min.css is what we want to link to in our HTML. So let's do that and I'll hide the file tree just to have a little more room here. And underneath the link to the Google font, we'll put in our link to our style sheet with the rel attribute style sheet and then the href equals, and now we can choose the CSS folder and we can choose main.min.css and save our file. Now I'll show the file tree again and we'll go back to our base file. And as we save and make changes, our live SAS compiler is watching and it will update our CSS file. Our base file will have the foundation, the basic definitions for the elements and things that are similar to elements, at least the semantic elements on our page. And so I'll put padding equals zero. And this is a CSS reset that I usually start with margin equals zero and box sizing is going to equal border box. And if I save that, we instantly see the changes here on the right because all of the margin and padding that was in there by default is now gone. And so we will be able to see our changes right away now. For the HTML element, I'm going to set the font family equal to Montserrat that we imported from Google and then have a sans serif fallback. Font size is going to be 22 pixels. And the color we can set equal to that text color variable we defined. And that text color was white, so almost all of the text is gone. Our skip link is here that we haven't hidden yet. But now let's define some body definitions and we'll be able to see that text once again. We'll start with the height of the body, a min height actually equal to uh, 100 viewport units. Background color equal to the background color variable we set. And then we're going to include one of those media query mixins we defined and we'll pass in 768 pixels, which is iPad size. And we'll have a font size of 36 pixels. Once the uh, viewport would be at least 768 pixels wide. When we save that, now we have that uh, flat black background and all of the text is showing up because it's white. We still have the images over here. So everything is applying as we expect it to. Now for the main element on our page, we'll set a max width 
of 800 pixels, so on very wide screens it doesn't uh, look too strange or grow too far. We'll set a margin of zero on top and bottom and auto on left and right so it would be centered. And then a height of 100 viewport units. So the main element will be as tall as the viewport. And then we'll set the display to flex and we'll set the flex direction to column. If we save that, it doesn't look like too much of a change here, but maybe a little bit. From there, we'll scroll again and apply some styles to the H1. We'll give it a margin of 0.5 rem on the top and bottom and 0 on the left and right. Font size, 1 rem. And we'll include another media query here, MQ. Once again, 768 pixels. And the font size will be 2 rem if uh, the screen is at least 768 pixels wide. Okay, scrolling for just a little more room. Now, we'll have the H1 if it has focus. And we'll do the same for the H2 if it has focus. We'll set the outline to none. And then we'll set the text decoration to underline because if you take away the outline when it has focus you need to do something else to indicate that it has focus so we'll apply an underline with the text decoration then the abbreviation element and you'll notice those over here because they have these dashed underlines the the dots under the CP and the P1 what we'll do here is just say text decoration none and we'll remove those that completes our base file. So now under components, we're going to create some files. We'll have an underscore, and I want to name this alley, which is A11Y, of course, starting with an underscore. This has will contain some styles that I specifically apply for accessibility. After that, we'll create another one uh, here, and we'll have an underscore animations. So we will have some animations to define. And after that, one more that goes in our components folder, and that is underscore utility.scss. And with those defined, let's go ahead and add them here in our import statements. I'll just copy an import statement from before. And after that, we'll select all three of the, well, all six, we might as well, and change them to components, but then after that we can change to each file name. So we have alley, we have animations, and then we have utility. And now that we're importing all of those files, we'll be able to see our changes again. Let's start with a class that I'll call off screen. And I use this in pretty much every project because I don't always want to see the headings that we put in, but I know they need to be there because many people navigate their web pages or web apps by heading, and it's important to give each, each individual section a heading because of that. But if we don't want to see it, we send it off screen, which makes it still readable, but yet uh, does not appear on the screen. So if we save this, now you see some of the things disappeared here that had the class of off screen. Now we'll apply a class for our skip link, which we see here says skip scoreboard. We do not intend, that, intend for that to be visible either, but we'll handle that in a different way. So we'll say position absolute top is minus 999 pixels, left is zero, background will give a text color, and so that is the opposite. So we're giving the background the text color, and we could call this background color, actually. Um, after that, padding 14 pixels, and we'll give this a Z index of one, so we know it will show up on top, and the color of the text will actually be the background color. So we're inverting the colors here. Let's go ahead and save that. And now it has disappeared but now we'll define something to let it show back up when it has the focus. So we have skip link, focus, and then also skip link, 
active. And then we'll say top auto and left auto. And now when that does get the focus, it will show up and we will be able to click on it or press enter on it. Okay, with our accessibility styles defined, let's go ahead and define the animations we're going to use. There are two different areas we saw animations in the demo of the app. One was when the rock, paper, scissors choices for player one actually moved or disappeared or centered. And that's not what we're defining here. We're defining the keyframes for when the computer counts down one, two, three, and then you see their choice. So it's that animation, and we need two animations defined for that, both with keyframes. One we'll call fade in from none, and this will start at 0%, and then the display, if I could spell display, will be none, and the opacity will be zero. But then after that, I'll go ahead and copy this, at 1%, we'll change the display to block, and then the opacity will still be zero. And then at 100%, we'll have a display of block, but an opacity of one. Now our next animation, we can copy this one, will be similar we'll call it fade out. We had fade in from none and this is a fade out. So we'll start at zero and it will be a block. And then we'll wait until we get to 99%. Oh, and we need to change the opacity to one there. And 99% will still be a block and still have an opacity of, well, we'll have an opacity of zero. Then at 100%, we'll have a display of none and an opacity of zero. So it really goes in the opposite direction as the first one, where we went zero to 100, started with none, then quickly switched to block and changed the opacity. This starts at block, the opacity is one, and it works its way almost to zero, and then we switch to a display of none at 100%, and it is totally zero. Moving on to our utility classes now, We'll start off with a couple of very simple ones. We have text align, and this is just our center class, and it aligns the text to the center. We have a hidden class. This just sets the display to none. And then we have a play again class, and really this is for our play again button that appears at the very end when we're ready to possibly start another game. And there was no real great section to put this in, so I just put it inside of the utility because it's not a part of any one section of the page. So we'll have a position of absolute, top 85%, left 50%, and you can change those percents if you wanna move around or play around with where the button appears on the page. Say translate, minus 50% and minus 50% under our transform, then it's a translate. Min width, 48 pixels. Min height, 48 pixels. That's the smallest you would ever want a button to appear, so it's good to set those minimums. 0 0.75 REM. I also say that's the smallest you ever want a button to appear because that's about fingerprint or thumbprint size just on average. Okay, font size, two rims. Border radius, we'll round those corners, 25 pixels. Opacity, we'll make it so you can see through because this will appear on top of some other things on the page at times, depending on how big the page is outline of none, and we'll set the cursor to a pointer for this button. And once we save that, we finish the utility file. Okay, we can now see some things centered over here in our application, but we still really need to define the game board and the scoreboard, and that all falls into place under the layout. 
So with that selected, let's go ahead and create underscore gameboard.scss and we can also create underscore dot scoreboard.scss and with those created I'm going to uh, collapse the open editor section here so we get a little more room in the file tree but with those created we want to go ahead and import them here and I'll select components select both of those and type layout and then the first one we import will be the well, we should do the scoreboard, it would be on top. So scoreboard and then game board. Now with those set to import, we're ready to define the scoreboard and the game board. And I'll start with scoreboard just because it's on top. So with that, we'll go scoreboard. And you may have noticed that SCSS or SAS supports nested styles and so we will do some nesting because we have nested sections here if you remember right we start with an h2 and then inside of that we had sections that both had h3 headings so here we'll have a width of 100 percent for the full scoreboard and a max width of 500 pixels margin zero on the top and bottom auto left and right and then we'll include our flex center mixin that we defined and then we'll set the flex wrap to wrap and then we'll include the media query that we defined and we'll say at 800 pixels justify content space between and then a max width of 800 pixels and now you can see that pulled the scoreboards together here some but those are just the parent styles for the overall scoreboard so now let's define and this is nested within the scoreboard class let's define the scoreboard section class and it'll be set to width which will be it we'll use a calc here and we'll say 100 percent minus five pixels and we'll set a max width equal to 500 pixels and we'll include a media query and again we'll say 800 pixels and the max width will be 395 pixels here and that is because we'll have the scoreboards on top of each other in mobile view but when it gets wide enough we'll set them left and right and so they'll be in a row instead of on top of each other okay we're scrolling up now but still within the scoreboard section class we're going to nest a scoreboard header, scoreboard two underscores and header. And here we'll say width 100%, background color, and this will be our text color. And then the color itself will be the background color here. The display be flex justify content will be space between which is why we're not using the mixin we previously defined and the align items will be center and now also inside the scoreboard header we'll set a definition for a paragraph element and we'll say margin zero and then 10 pixels left and right let's save that and now you can see we've inverted the color on the headings for the scoreboard and the space evenly spaced the P1 all time and computer player or P1 session and computer player out evenly. I'm going to scroll up and underneath the scoreboard header, we'll define the scoreboard two underscores and row. Here we'll say display is flex and the flex dash wrap will be no wrap and then the width will be 100 percent and the font size will set to 1.25 rem now we can see the scoreboard row has changed a little bit now still inside the scoreboard row we're going to define the scoreboard score class so we've got quite a bit of nesting going on here hopefully you're not getting too lost 
with that. Uh, one extension I use is Bracket Pair Colorizer 2. And so when I click on these brackets, you can see the line between them. So that is worth searching for also. It is called Bracket Pair Colorizer 2. And that might help you not lose track of those. We'll set the display for the scoreboard two underscores score to flex. And this one we could actually pull in the uh, include. We could include the flex center here. And then we will use a width. Let me tab over there correctly. Width of 50%. And then we'll do a min height of 2.5 rem. And we'll set a border equal to two pixels, solid, and the text dash color. Well, if I save that, now we see our border around here, but it's a little thick in the middle. We will adjust that in a second. But underneath this text color, we also need to go ahead and include one media query. And this will be the other media query we had before. So min, that needs to be a Q, there we go min w and then max h so min width max height we'll pass in 768 pixels but also 1024 pixels and so this is definitely just applying to ipads and possibly ipad pros <coughs> tablet sizes and we'll set that min height to 1.5 rem and it looks like we have an error with our live sas compiler and that's what happens. This window pops up. You've got the output window. And what I should have done before actually is press Control B as in boy again to give us a little more room over here to see everything. We'll just drag this up and see what it's talking about here. It looks like we have an undefined variable at uh, min width. It's in one of the media queries. And let me get the detail here looks okay it's in this media query the min width max height so let's go back to where we defined that media query i don't think i had called it until this point of the code so control b again to see the file tree i open uh, mixins over here where we defined that and we can look and i've got size one and size two as parameters and then in the function once again control b to give us some more room uh, in the function itself, oh, I just defined size here. I didn't put size one again. So if you were following along and made the same error as I did, please change that to size one that goes with size two. As we had not defined just size, it has to be either size one or size two. If we save that, it should make a lot more sense. And now we can see it said success briefly down here and it says it's watching again. I'll press control B to go back and then back to our scoreboard. And now that I'm at the scoreboard, control B once again to hide that file tree, but now this should be good. We shouldn't have an error. And from there, we can finish defining what we need to for the scoreboard. So we've got the min width max height media query here. Underneath our scoreboard score, we need to go ahead and define scoreboard, two underscores, score, and then nth, that's nth dash child, and we'll put odd, so only the odd children of the scoreboard underscore score, and we'll set the border right equal to zero, which should make our middle line thinner. We don't have a double line there now, and that makes all the difference for that middle line to match up. And then right underneath that, we need to also define scoreboard underscore score once again. And for the focus pseudo selector, we'll say outline none. Background color, we will invert. We'll set to the text color. So then likewise, we'll set the color equal to the background color. And once again, that's when the score has focus or if we were tabbing through the scores, then it would invert the color and make 
the one that we have focused on stand out. So we'll go ahead and save that as well. Now we're almost finished, but we have just a little bit more to add, and that is for this scoreboard section. If we follow my bracket pair colorizer here that goes through the section, we will come down below and define scoreboard two underscores section and then the last dash child. So the very last child of that and we'll say margin top equals 10 pixels and then we'll include a media query MQ and we'll say 800 pixels and then we'll set the margin dash top equal to zero. With our scoreboard styles complete, I'll double check this Nope, it's the same error showing there, so we can really just close that window. Live SAS compiler will keep watching. I'll press Control B once again to see the file tree, and we can select the game board file. And from there, I can press Control B and hide that to give us a little more room. And we'll start with the game board class that will be the parent class for anything we nest inside it about the game board. And we'll start with a calc of 100% width minus five pixels, so a width using the calc method. And then we'll include the flex center mixin we defined, but then we'll override the justify, oh, and then I put at flex center, that won't work. It will include flex center, there it is. Justify content will override what is in the flex center and we'll use space evenly. And I believe there was an earlier instance where I could have done that as well. Uh, margin dash left will set to five pixels and then I'll include a media query and for this media query we'll say once the width is 375 pixels wide just a little bit larger than our iPhone 5 we we'll use width and the calc method again say 100 percent minus 15 pixels and a margin on the left side of not 50, but 15 pixels. We can save that, and we see a little bit of a change, but not much yet. Now we'll define our game board two underscore square class, and this will be nested inside the game board class. We'll have a width of 33.33%, .33%, and we'll include our flex center here as well. We can save this, and now we see the images are overlapping at least, but now within the game board square, we have some nested uh, definitions. And we'll start with the image itself. So we'll set the image equal to a width of 100%. And we'll set the cursor to a pointer when it's pointing at the images to select. And then a transition of 500 milliseconds. And that will be used, of course, with the animation. And outline to none. We can save that. And wow, they just pop right into place. That is nice. But we need to go ahead and define just a few more things. Image hover pseudo selector and image focus pseudo selector. And we'll say width 110%. So they'll get just a little bit larger. And then we'll use this filter and we'll set the brightness equal to 120%. And that will really indicate that we have selected those or we have the focus on them or we're hovering the mouse over them and especially since we've removed the outline something like that needs to happen okay underneath that i'll scroll just a little and we'll put in a style for a paragraph now we don't currently have paragraphs in our html but we will when these count down one two three in our computer animation so we need to define these paragraph elements specifically for those numbers that count down. So we have rather large numbers at 5 rem. And then we'll name our animation that we use, and that is fade in from none. And we'll say one second ease dash in. There we go. And then we'll include a media query, 768 pixels, iPad size, and we'll say font size is six rems, so we can make those numbers even just a little bit larger there. Let's scroll up, and underneath the paragraph, we need to define our fade out class. So when this is applied, 
fade out will be applied. And we'll set the opacity to zero to begin with. And then we'll name our animation here as well. And this also applies to those numbers. So fade out one second, ease dash in dash out and save. Now we don't want to be nested anymore. So let's click this purple curly brace that you see on my screen. And this is the game board square. So we don't want to be nested in the game board square. So this is outside of that. We'll define a selected class. And here we'll have margin, zero, and auto. Well, and auto is the left and right, so that essentially centers it. And we'll set a transition. Now this is the animation you'll see for the uh, player one selection. And the transition will be on the margin, and it will be 0 0.5 or a half second and linear. And then after that animation, for the margin, which would center whichever is still left on the page, essentially it would adapt to what is left behind, we'll set the not dash selected class. And this visibility will be hidden and a width of zero. And then the transition for these, the width would be 0 0.5 seconds and linear and the visibility will also be 0 0.5 seconds in linear. So when this happens, the width will slowly diminish and the visibility will slowly diminish. And that's what we saw in our demo when the two that are not selected get smaller and smaller until they disappear. And then the margin, of course, adapts as well. And it slowly become whatever uh, select, the selection is that is left slowly becomes centered and is the main choice. And with that, we've completed the styles for our application. So I'll press Control B again, and we can see over here we have our four folders that we needed, at least in our seven to one architecture. Again, we didn't need themes, pages, or vendors, but we have abstracts, base, components, and layout, and of course the files within. And then we have our main SCSS that imports all of those different files. And then our live SAS compiler is watching and compiles those to CSS where we get our main.min.css that is actively imported into our HTML. And now we see the completed styled application here. So all that is left is to apply JavaScript and make our rock, paper, scissors game interactive. Okay, before moving on to our JavaScript, a quick correction, and it works as is, I just wanna fix it. If we go to our underscore scoreboard partial in our layout folder of our SCSS, and we scroll up, we should find the scoreboard header. I had mentioned that we could have imported our, or included our flex center mixin, and then we could just overwrite the justify content, which is center. So in this regard, then we don't need the display flex and we don't need the align items center because they're already in the mixin. And the justify content then just overwrites the justify content center that's in the flex center mixin. So we can save that and everything is essentially the same except we've saved a line of code and this is what I should have done to begin with. Okay, let's start our JavaScript. I'll collapse all of the SCSS or SAS as I named the folder. You could also name that SCSS if you want to. Either one works. I may actually rename that later. You'll still get the nice icons over here. If you use VS Code dash icons extension, that's how I get these icons in my file tree. Okay, we're ready for the JS. It goes in the distribution folder. So we'll create a folder here named JS. Inside the JS folder, we'll create a file named main.js that we'll need to link to from our HTML. But while I'm creating files, I'm also going to create one that is a class file. So I'll start it with a capital letter and it will be game.js. Now in the index.html, and I'll press control B as in boy, once again, to hide that, we need to go ahead and import this JavaScript with a script tag. So we'll set this equal to source. And here we get the choices in VS code and I'll choose JS and then main. And then also we'll say type equals module. 
because I'm going to import in the game class as well. And I'll press Control B as in boy again to bring the file tree back and we'll start on the main JS file. And here at the very top, I'm going to define an init app function as an arrow function. And then underneath, I will say document.add event listener. And we will listen for the DOM content loaded. And let's go ahead and press Control B to hide the file tree and get a little more room. And here we'll call init app when that event is fired. Now we'll have several actions that we want to take inside the init app function that will fire off. But first, let's go ahead and define our game.js file. Now I could show the file tree to show that JS file and click on it as I have been, but you also notice the files are available up here. So we only have the two JavaScript files. I'm just going to go over here and click game.js and we're ready to define our class. We'll start the class out with export default class and I'll name the class game and then obj for object. And then I'll use constructor and we'll say this.active is going to equal false. This.p1 and then all time is going to equal zero. This.cp all time is going to equal zero. This.p1 session is going to equal zero. And this.cp session is going to equal zero. So you can see what we're tracking in the object, whether the game is active or not. And then we're tracking the all time scores of the player in the computer, as well as the current session scores of the player in the computer. So now we'll have some getter and setters, or these would be uh, using get and set. However, I don't like to use the keywords get and set, even though you can do that in JavaScript. I just like to use descriptive function names so I can see that directly in the code as well. So I'll say get active status and this is going to return this.active. And after get active status, we'll have a start game function. And if we start the game, this.active is going to be equal to true. And of course, if you have a start game method, I said function before, but since these are in a class, these are truly methods. This would be false if we end the game. After that, we need to get and possibly set those scores. So we'll have a get p1 all time. And this is going to return this dot p1 all time. And then if we set p1 all time, we'll need to pass in a number for that. And then this would be this dot p1 all time equals number. And then this would be very similar if I copy these two, paste them, and then we want to do the CP all time. And this would be CP all time. And then the same here as far as setting it. And we can save. And now for the session, it will be just a little different than just a getter and a setter. We'll go ahead and have a getter, so get p1 session. And here we'll return this.p1 session. And then we'll do a getter for the computer while we're at it. So get cp session. And this would be a return this.cp session. But then when we set these, we won't be passing in a number. It would only increment by one. So we'll say a p1 wins function. If player one wins, we'll call this and we'll say this dot p1 session. And then we can just say plus equals one. So we're adding one to whatever that total is. But we also need to add one to the all time when this happens. So we'll say this dot p1 all time plus equals one. And now as you might guess, we'll do something 
pretty much identical for the computer. So we'll say if the CP wins, then we would switch these both to CP and save. And now we've completed our class. Okay, let's go back to the main JavaScript file. And now at the very top, we need to import our game object. So we'll import game object from dot slash game dot js. And then underneath that, we'll go ahead and instantiate it with the name game it will be a new game object. And now we can use, oops, we didn't put the operators there. Now we can use this game in our code to call the methods that we defined. So we'll start out with several functions here. We're going to get the all time data. We'll gather that first. And then we'll update the scoreboard. After that, we'll be ready to play. So we'll listen for a player choice. And then we'll also need to listen for the enter key because we're making our application accessible and we want to make it playable if you use a screen reader or if you just prefer to use the keyboard and tab through the choices, that should also be an option. And then we'll also need to listen for the play again choice once the game is over. And because of how these images are, and they're a little inconsistent between all three of these, and because we change them out for numbers, so we actually change out what's in there throughout the uh, gameplay, we need to go ahead and kind of lock in the game board height. So that is something just because of, of the things that we're changing in the DOM. And eventually, we'll need to set the focus where we want it to be to start a new game. So these are the tasks. Maybe I should have numbered those, but that's what we'll be doing. And we'll call all of this as we initialize the game and it will be ready to go again. So let's start off with this uh, getting the all time data. And to do that, we'll call a function called init all time data. We can define init all time data right underneath our DOM content loaded here. And if you wonder why I can use arrow functions and yet define a function underneath where it is called, I can't do that with this first one, but I can after that. I have a video on hoisting that you'll want to check out and it will explain how I can do that. But you see right here, I'm using the uh, add event listener for DOM content loaded. It calls a knit app that is defined up here. Okay, so we'll define const init all time data. No parameters needed. And then we'll use the game and we'll say set p1 all time. And then we'll say parse int and we'll look to our local storage, which is where we're going to store those. And we'll say get item and we're going to store it under p1 all time. But if it's not there, we can put in the short circuit operator, which is like an or, and just say set it to zero. And now, as you might guess, we need to do this for the computer as well. So it's going to be easier to just copy that, paste that in. And now we can say set CP all time. And here, of course, we would have named this CP. With that saved, it looks like I can get rid of the extra line here. It's just a little longer than our screen was allowing. Let's go ahead and press Alt-Z to let those wrap. And now you can see those wrap down and we'll be able to see the functions better. But we've taken care of the all time data function. Of course, we don't have that saved to local storage yet, but so they'll just be set to zero for now. But we will eventually save the previous scores to our local storage. And that way, when we come back to our application, we've got persistent data and we will be able to still see our all time score record. Now we need to update the scoreboard. We'll start with const update scoreboard with a capital S and a capital B. It's an arrow function. And now we'll define a variable and I'll call this player one for P1 and then a capital A T S for all time score equals document dot get 
element by ID, and now we'll pass in P1 underscore all underscore time underscore score. And once we've defined that, we can say P1 ATS dot text content. And let's set this equal to the game dot get P1 all time. And our method will fill that in. And then we'll say P1 ATS dot aria and then capital L for label. And this is what a screen reader would read. And we'll use a template literal here and we'll say player one has and now we'll call game dot get p1 all time p1 all time and whatever that value is and then we'll say all time wins not wins but wins there we go and once we finish that template literal we're ready to move on to the next and we can cap copy just a little more here so we don't have to type everything because now we're doing this for the computer player. So we have all three of those selected using Control D. I selected the other two. And I'll delete the P1 and put in CP. And instead of P1 here, we're also grabbing the CP all time score. And instead of P1 in the method, this is a capital C, lowercase p, for CP all time. And here we'll have computer player has, and then of course we'll get the computer player all time scores with the CP as well. And now we've got the all time scores for the player one and the computer player, and we've got the ARIA label, so it, the screen reader will read the correct number of wins as well. Now I'm going to paste again, but we'll need to modify this for the session. So instead of all time, we'll just say, uh, I'll grab the P1 ATS, select all three, come to the end of that, and we'll just call it P1S for player one session. And now we'll have the P1, instead of all time score, we'll have the session score. And then instead of getting all time, we'll get P1 session. Since we do that twice, we'll select both with control D and we're getting the P1 session. So we'll have player one has, instead of all time wins, we'll say wins this session. And that looks correct. So now we can copy this and do something very similar for the computer player. So instead of P1S, we'll select all three again. And it looks like we've got an extra one there just in case. Um, we'll go CPS, but we'll have to change this back because that's not what that needs to be. This would be the CP session score. And the method we're calling has a capital C. So get CP session. And then this would be computer player and this also needs to be CP session with a capital C there and now we have completed the full scoreboard update and with that completed we can call it up here where we expect it to be which would be update scoreboard and save we're now ready to listen for a player choice so we'll delete our up a scoreboard note and we're ready to scroll down and define listen for player choice and that will start off with the const and then listen for player choice and inside of this we'll first define player one images and to do that we will use document query selector all and we're going to select the player board. And then after the player board, we'll select the game board, two underscores square, and then we'll specify the images within that. So we're being very specific with the selector as far as grabbing the player board, not the computer's board, and then the game board squares, and then the images within those. 
And after that, we need to put a semicolon here just in that line. I know that wraps kind of weird where that dot is before the next class, which is game board square. But I think we can live with that for now. And then we'll say P1 images, and we can use for each. And we'll say for each image, and we'll have an arrow function here. And now we'll say image dot add event listener. So we'll add an event listener to each image, and it will be listening for the click. We'll pass in the event here. Now inside the listener, we'll say if the game get active status is true, that means a game's already going, and so we'll just return because the game starts after an image had been clicked on, essentially, at least how we're defining it here. So if we've already started a game, in other words, it, uh, it prohibits a double click if you can't suddenly click a different choice after you've clicked the first one. And after that, we've got const player choice equals event.target.parentElement.id. And if you remember in our HTML, which I can press Control B as in boy and go back, uh, in our HTML, and now I should probably hide it so we can see it better, on the game board, these divs actually held the, here it is, rock, paper, scissors. And so the div has the ID of rock, paper, or scissors. And that's what we're grabbing when we grab the parent element ID from the image. Okay, headed back to our JavaScript. And once we've grabbed that target ID, which is either rock, paper, or scissors, we're going to call a helper function that says update p1 message. And we pass in the player choice. And this would be something uh, where we're going to change the text on the screen right here. And then after we do that, we'll say p1 images for each. So we're calling another for each loop inside the first one here. We're saying for each image. And here we'll say if image is equal to the event.target, set the image dot parent element dot class list dot add will add the selected class to that parent element and then we'll have an else and if it's not we'll say image dot parent element dot class list dot add and we'll add the not selected class and that is enough for that and then underneath Outside of this for, loop, for each loop, here we'll have an animation sequence that we launch. And although we're not quite ready to do that yet, let's go ahead and look at the completed app again, which looks much the same, and we'll see how some of this works. So once we click on Rock, here's an animation sequence. And now we had tie game and then our play again button shows up. So the animation sequences need to launch after we make our selection. I'll play again and do one more. So that's an animation and then that's a separate animation. The bottom one was with the keyframes. The top was with slowly making the others disappear and then of course at the same time slowly making whatever is selected go to the center as well. Okay so Back in the one we're working on here, we need to work on this animation sequence. Actually, let's hold off on that animation sequence because we didn't define our update p1 message yet. So let's go beneath this function and define that. We'll call that update p1 message. Let's set that equal to the choice, which is the player choice that comes in. And here we'll grab the p1 message ID, we'll set this equal to document dot get element by ID. And there we have the P1 message ID that we'll grab. And then let's grab the text content while we're at it. 
From there, we'll say p1 message plus equals, and let's use a template literal here and put a space first, and then we'll grab the choice, that's lowercase choice, and we're just grabbing the first letter by using the zero in brackets, and then we'll say two uppercase, and then right after that, we'll go ahead and say choice dot slice one. And so that is the rest of the word. So all we've done is essentially put the choice in proper case now with the capital first letter. And then we can say document dot get element by ID. Grab our P1 message again and set the text content equal to the p1 variable that we defined. And so now when we make a choice, the player one chooses, we'll change to player one has selected. So if we do this, watch this text right here that says player one chooses, and it says player one chooses rock, and it will insert whichever choice we make. So if we choose scissors, it's player one chooses scissors, and that's how that template literal works. Okay, back to the one we're working on. We've defined the update message. Let's hold off on this animation because it's a little complicated and we've got a few others to add first. So let's call this listen for player choice here. Listen for player choice. Then we need to listen for the enter key as well. And that's just a little bit of an addition to what we're doing. So we can come down here and we'll put it before the update p1 message and we'll define listen for enter key and here we'll say window dot add event listener and then we'll listen for the key down event and we'll pass in the event to this anonymous function and here we'll say if the event.code equals enter and the event.target.tag name equals IMG in all caps. Then we'll have the event, oops, now I need lowercase, event.target dot click. So it will be like we clicked on one of the images if we press enter. So it has to be the enter key and it has to be an image when this key down event occurs or nothing will happen. And we can save that. And so now we've got the listen for enter key completed. And we'll just add it to our list right here and remove that. And now we also have listen for the play again. Let's scroll down and put it right underneath our other listener. So underneath the listen for enter key, we'll say const listen for play again. And in this arrow function, we'll say document dot query selector, and we'll grab that form that we didn't even give an ID to. It's the only form on the page. And we'll add an event listener We'll listen for the submit event and then we'll take the event and I'm just going to use E here I'm running out of room anyway and now with this event we'll say E dot prevent default because if not the form would reload the page and of course that would zero out our session so we don't want it to reload the page on submit and then we're going to call a function named reset board so we need to remember to define reset board as well. So this is a to-do and we can put that in our code. And I am using another extension here uh, that highlights my to-dos. I can't even remember the name of the extension, but you can search for different extensions for Visual Studio Code that will make your to-dos stand out. So I've got that saved in my code. And now we can select this function and call it up here in our init app. And that only leaves a couple of functions left. And one is to lock the game board height. 
and the other is to set the focus to start the new game. So let's save this and let's go ahead and define our lock the game board height function. We can scroll down underneath the listeners and right here we'll define const lock computer game board height and specifically this is for the computer game board the bottom one because this is where we change out the different hands and shapes here for numbers and so that could make the height jump up and down and we want to avoid that and this function will help us avoid that so we're going to define the CP game board we'll set this equal to document.query selector and now we'll grab the computer board and then the game board within the computer board. Whoops, that's a lowercase b here. And then we'll also define the CP game board styles. We're going to set this equal to get computed style and pass in the CP game board. And then we'll define a height. We'll set this equal to CP GB styles dot get property value and we'll pass in the height. And then the CP game board dot style dot min height will be equal to the, if I can spell it, will be equal to the height. And now well, normally we wouldn't modify the CSS styles directly in JavaScript, but this is an example of a time to do that because we just want to set the min height. It's not a predetermined value. It's something we're grabbing by using get computed style. And with that defined, I'm going to grab the name, which is a longer function name, and scroll back up to our init app function and paste that in as well. And now we're left with set the focus to start the new game. And instead of using a function to set that focus here, I'm just going to say document.querySelector h1 focus. We made that h1 focusable by putting a tab index of zero on it. And so now when a new game is loaded, it will focus on the rock, paper, scissors headline, which a screen reader would do as well, and then it would be able to read that. And the first tab after the rock, paper, scissors is our skip link, so it allow, allows a user to skip the scoreboard if they want to and go straight to playing. If not, they can go through the scoreboard and read the totals. Okay, let's save the file, and now we're ready to define the computer animation sequence function. And so we'll just put that under all of the others. And we'll say const computer animation sequence. And we're going to pass in the player choice. And now the first thing we'll have is an interval variable. And we want to use let because we will be adding to that. But right now we'll set it to 1000 and that will be 1000 milliseconds. From here, we're going to use the set timeout. Set timeout accepts an anonymous function. And now inside this set timeout, we're going to call another function called computer choice animation. And here I'll pass in the CP rock, which is the ID for the rock uh, container for the image there. And then I'll also pass in the number one. After that, we'll put a comma. And the next argument for set timeout after the function is the milliseconds that are accepted. And so we'll pass in our interval value there. I kind of wish this was all fitting on one line. If I could possibly squeeze that over just a little bit for this. Maybe I can squeeze that as well. I don't know how much room we have. It's getting a little tight there, but just, just for this portion, I can resize it or bring it back later on. Okay, so I, I got the interval right here, 
and the computer choice animation function. So we need to define that next. Let's come right underneath and define computer choice animation. This is going to receive an element ID and a number. And that's exactly what we see above. We've got the element ID, which is the div that contains the rock here. And then we pass in a number as well. So let's define our element and we'll set this equal to document.get element by ID. And we'll pass in the element ID that the function receives. And then we'll say element.first element child. And then we'll say remove, which would be the image that's inside of it. And then we'll define a paragraph variable here. So it's document.create element. So we're creating the paragraph element. And then the text content of the paragraph that we're creating will be the number that we've passed into the function. And then we'll say element.append child and we'll pass in that paragraph we created and we can save our function. So in this example where we have uh, the CP rock ID here, we're removing this rock image, replacing it with the number one that we pass in in a paragraph that has been created. And so let's go ahead and add at least one more computer animation uh, timeout here before we try to see what happens with these. And in this one, we'll also call the computer choice animation, but it won't be CP rock, it would be paper next, and the number two, and then interval will have a different value. We're going to have interval plus equals 500. And so we're running into just a little more space here to let it wrap, but that's okay. We'll save that. And so now we have our computer animation sequence that is calling at least two different uh, images to be replaced with the number one and the number two. Now we may easily get an error here as not everything is complete, but let's go ahead and put our animation in place, computer animation sequence. And I believe it needs to receive the player choice that we have right there. And we'll save that. We'll come back and look at this again. And that looks good enough to give it a spin. And our animation works up to that point without a problem. Let's go ahead and give ourselves some more room to see everything. Okay, I've got the Chrome window back in place. It makes our animation sequences wrap the lines just a little bit, but that's the room we've got to work with. I don't wanna make the font get any smaller. But right now, if we click on a player one selection, they animate correctly and we're to the countdown through the number two. So let's go ahead and complete our computer animation sequence. So the next one, we'll copy this second line and remember it's auto wrapping because I pressed Alt plus the letter Z as in zebra. And that goes ahead and makes the lines wrap, but there's really no line break there. Uh, scissors is the next one we need here. And of course the number three, we're going to count down one, two, three. And the interval, once again, we're adding another 500 milliseconds here. We can save that. We can go ahead and click and try it out. We've got all the way through the three count, and that's good. Now we need to go ahead and create another timeout. And here, instead of calling a computer animation, we're going to call a different function. And this is called delete countdown. And it is going to have a different value here as well. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not delete countdown. I'm one ahead of myself. This is countdown fade. And this will have a different value. Instead of 500, let's put 750 right there. And now we need to define the countdown fade function. So we can do that right underneath the computer animation. Say const countdown fade. And here we'll define our countdown. 
and this is equal to document dot query selector all and then it's a computer board space and then the game board underscore twice square and then a space and the paragraph now that we know we've got that and we say countdown for each and we work our way through the countdown with each element there which is the paragraph we say l dot class name equals fade out which is one of those animation classes we applied and they need a semicolon there. After that, let's go ahead and save and test this out. And our numbers fade out as we expect them. That's great. Now let's look at what is next in the animation sequence. We have another timeout. And in this one, it's going to be just a little different because there are two actions we need to make. So we need to put our curly braces back in the anonymous function. And it's going to look more like that, except we'll have a semicolon and there'll be different functions to call. So the first one, before I wanted to type this in already, it is delete countdown. And then the next function after that is called finish game flow. And we pass the player choice right onto it. So we can save that. Let's comment out the finish game flow and just make sure the delete countdown function works. So we can scroll down underneath our countdown fade and define our delete countdown function. Whoa. For this function, I need to grab the same countdown with the query selector all that we defined here to get the paragraph elements. So I just copy that and paste it in. And once I have countdown, I'm going to work our way through the countdown with a for each again. We'll say for each element. And then I'll just say element.remove. And we're deleting all of those elements we created there for the countdown. So we might not actually see anything because they've already faded out. But let's just make sure we don't get any errors as we execute that. And that's all good. So we are ready now to move on. Okay, let's go back to our animation sequence as it's not quite complete. We know we have the finish game flow function to define, and that's a rather large one that's a, a procedural function that calls a few others. So we want to go ahead and just add the last piece of the animation first, and that's one more timeout call. And this one has a different value at the end of 1000. And this is going to call to ask user to play again. And once we've saved that, we're ready to find that function. And let's make sure we didn't already define it. No, we didn't. So we can scroll to the bottom. And here we can define ask user to play again. And it needs no parameters either. And we can say const play again equals document get element by ID, we pass in play again, which is our button that asks, and we'll say play again dot class list dot toggle, and we're toggling the hidden class, and then we'll say play again dot focus. So when we toggle that, it will remove the hidden class and it will be visible, and it will give the button focus. So let's go ahead and see what we get, even though we don't have the finish game flow function. We get our play again button. And I don't think this will be working yet. Nope, we definitely get an error because we haven't defined the reset board that is our to do. So we'll just go ahead and reload for now. Okay, looking back at our code, we haven't completed the finish game flow function here in the animation sequence. But we also have that other to do for the reset board. So let's go ahead and create this reset board function now, and then we can worry about finishing the game flow. So we'll define 
reset board with the capital B, no parameters. And we need to grab all of the game squares. So we say const game squares. This is going to equal document dot query selector all. And now we just grab game board and then div. And this is grabbing all of the game squares for player one and the computer both. We're saying game squares for each, for each element, or we could say for each square. We're going to say element dot class name equals game board two underscores square. So this is eliminating any of the other classes that were added during the course of the gameplay. And then we're also going to grab the computer player squares, set this equal to document.query selector all, and this would be the computer board only, and then the game board two underscores square, there we go. And now we can say cp squares dot for each. And then once again, we'll just say element here. I'm going to scroll up to get a little more room on the page. And now for each, we're going to have to work through and create the images that we removed for the numbers. So we'll say if the element dot first element child, then we'll say element dot first element child dot remove and then we'll say if element dot id equals computer player underscore rock then we're going to create game image and we'll pass in rock and the element that we have just grabbed and let's go ahead, I can just repeat this by pressing, I believe, Shift, Alt, and the down arrow. Yes, got similar lines now, and we'll just take rock here, select it with Control D, and put paper. And then we'll take rock again, select with Control D, and put scissors. So what we're doing is creating the game image for all those, but if it's the first element child, we are removing it because that shows the previous selection or the selection from the previous game. So that's why we want to remove that first one. And that's the end of the for each loop. But after that for each loop, we still have a few other things to reset on the page for a new game. So we need to get element by ID and grab the player one message and grab the text content here and set it equal to player one chooses as each game starts out with, with the ellipses. Now I'm going to do shift alt and the down arrow again. And here I'm going to grab the CP message and set this equal to computer chooses. There we go. After that, we need to go ahead and grab the play again. So I'm going to call this aria result though because we're going to use this as a message that the uh, aria or screen reader could read so we'll say get element by id and i'm grabbing the play again button then i'll say aria uh, result there you are dot aria label equals player one chooses without the ellipses. And then that's what will be read. So it doesn't read the result of the game twice. It will read player one chooses when that is uh, pressed the second, well, when it's pressed, it'll have focus before that and it would read the result of the game. And so then we change the result. So it reads player one chooses as it starts the new game. Okay, then we once again have document.get element by ID, player one message again, and we give it focus this time. 
and let's do the document dot get element by ID one more time and this time we'll grab play again and we'll the class list and we'll toggle and we toggle the hidden class so the play again button is then hidden and then we'll say game dot end game which is calling the method that we defined on our game object that actually ends the game so it is not active so a new game can start with this function created now we need to create the create game image function that we use three times within it and we can do that right underneath. And so with create game image, it does need to receive a couple of parameters. We'll call the first one the icon, and we'll call the second one append to element. So when we passed those in, we passed in which icon we needed, and then we passed in the element. So this is the element that's passed in is where the icon is being appended or the image is being appended. And we'll start out by defining the image and we'll say equals document.createElement and we're creating an image element. From there we'll say the image.source is equal to, and this is a template literal, we have the image folder slash now we pass in the icon parameter, and then we'll say .png. All the images are PNGs. And then the image.alt is equal to the name of the icon. And then we'll append to element.appendChild, and we pass in the image. And that will recreate those images. So while we haven't finished the game flow with that previous function we haven't defined yet, which there's still several steps to that of things to take care of as the game ends, let's see what we get so far in our rock, paper, scissors game. Not bad, not bad at all. So we'll say play again. Okay, and we're not seeing the computer choice here yet, so the first child element is getting deleted because the previous choice for the game wasn't showing. But that's because we haven't even added the code for how the computer makes a choice yet, or we're not displaying the choice afterwards either. So that's why we only see two down here. That will change. Let's go ahead and complete out that finish game flow, which will essentially add everything else we need to complete our game. So finish game flow is here in the computer animation sequence and it is called right here with a 750 delay which I believe needs to be 1000. So let's go ahead and save that. And then let's scroll down to underneath our delete countdown function and we'll add this function. So const finish game flow. It does receive the player choice. And so now we're going to have some helper functions along the way. This is a bit more of a procedural function as we wrap up the game. And the first thing we're going to define is the computer choice. And we'll say get computer choice. So we need to define how the computer makes its choice. So right underneath, we'll define this get computer choice function there we go and this will be a random number that'll be equal to math.floor and then that will contain math.random we'll take it times 3 from here we'll define a rps array which is rock, paper, scissors. And in the array, we'll have rock, paper, and scissors available. And then we'll return the rock, paper, scissors array, and we pass in the random number. So whichever of those numbers that we get, zero, one, or two, because the zero position is the first of the array, is what we'll show here. So we pass in either zero, one, or two, and we get one of these values back 
from this function. The next thing we need to do in our finished game flow is determine the winner. So then we'll define a winner and we'll have this equal to determine winner and we'll pass in the player choice and now we have the computer choice. Underneath our get computer choice, let's define our determine winner function. And once again, it receives the player choice and the computer choice. I need another equal sign over here. So this is where our logic occurs in the program to determine who wins. And let's start by handling the tie. We'll just say if the player choice, and let's just call this player and computer to shorten it up here, player and computer. So if the player equals the computer, we just want to return tie because we've got a tie. That's easy enough to figure out. Then we can say if and inside our if statement here we can have several comparisons. We'll just say if player equals rock and computer equals paper and then we can put an or And then I should just copy that line down. Shift, Alt, and an arrow. There we go. Or if computer equals, or player equals paper, and computer equals scissors. And let's just copy one more line down. And then I'll get rid of the or right there. And we'll have player equals scissors, and computer equals rock. These are all the combinations that the computer could win with. So if any of those are true, we're simply going to return computer. And otherwise, we'll return player. We don't even need to examine because if it gets past these two if statements, we know the player is victorious. This should be a string. There we go. And so there is our determine winner function. Okay, back in the finish game flow function, we now need to define an action message. And we'll set this equal to build action message. And here we're going to pass in three parameters. So I'll just put this on a separate line. We'll say winner, player choice, and computer choice. And if I save that, prettier may wrap that, it looks like it's okay with it. So we have action message being defined here, so we need this build action message function. Right underneath determine winner, we'll define our build action message function, and it accepts the winner, the player choice, and the computer choice. And here, in a similar logic, we'll say if the winner equals tie, we'll return tie game. We'll say if the winner equals computer, then we'll define an action equals get action and pass in the computer choice. And we'll return a template literal. And here I'm going to have to define a proper case function, which makes me want to go back in the code because I've already used a proper case option once before where I didn't define the function. So we can go back and correct that as well. But for now we have a proper choice for the computer choice. And after that we need a space and then we need our action that we're going to get. And then once again, proper case for the player choice. And now once that's complete, we can end with a period, end out the sentence, and a semicolon. 
And then we can have an else in our if statement here if they're the winner. And now in this else, I believe we could copy some of this down. And now we could say action is to the player choice. And then, of course, we switch what we have here as well for the computer. And so now we're passing in the opposite message. We just have the player choice first, but we have this proper case function to create as well. And also a get action function. So let's define get action first and we'll come back to proper case and then I'll get to apply proper case even retroactively where I could have used it before. So here we'll pass the choice into get action and get action is just going to return uh, the result of a ternary statement here. So choice equals rock. And if that is true, we would return this action verb smashes. But else, if it's not, then we'll see if choice equals paper. And if that's true, paper wraps rock. But then if that's not true, we're going to return cuts because scissors as the cuts action. So this is a chained ternary if it looks a little strange to you or if you haven't seen it before, but we're seeing if choice is equal to rock. And if it is equal to rock, we're going to go ahead and return the action verb uh, smashes. And then if it's not equal to rock, we're going to see if choice is equal to paper. And then if it's equal to paper, we're going to return the action verb wraps. But then if it's not, we're going to return cuts because at that point we've already checked rock and paper so we know it's scissors. So that is the get action function. Now let's go ahead and check the proper case function. And this is something we've actually done earlier in the code and we just didn't turn it into a function. And now since we're using the same uh, action several times, we're going to go ahead and create a function that handles it for us in uh, less lines of code. So with this template literal here, we'll say string and we're getting the very first letter of the string and the string is what's passed into the function. Then we say to uppercase and then we just concatenate here. Actually, we don't even need to concatenate since it's in a uh, template literal, we can just put it right next to it and say string dot slice and a one. And that would be the rest of the word. Put the semicolon there. And that is essentially turning a string to proper case. Well, if you remember with me, way earlier in our update p1 message function, we did the same type of action. So we can scroll up to that here it is, and we essentially did the same thing right here. So instead of all of this, now we can save ourselves some code and we can say proper case and we can pass in our choice. And that should give us the exact same result as what we previously were doing with uh, quite a bit more code there. Okay, now we need to get back to our finish game flow function and finish up the rest of this application. We don't have much further to go. Now that we have the action message, we need to display the action message. And so we'll pass in the action message to this function that will display it. I'll go ahead and copy this. And now we can scroll down just underneath our proper case function and we can define this function that receives the action message. Okay, we'll grab the computer message area, which is the area over here that says computer chooses with the ellipses. And we'll set this equal to 
that area, which is document.get element by ID, and it's the CP message. From there, we'll set the CP message text content equal to the action message. And that should be it. So that's easy enough. And now we'll go back to our larger function, finish the game flow. Here it is. After display action message, we need to go ahead and make a list here to finish things out. So we're going to update aria with the result. And then we're going to update the score state. Then we're going to update persistent data. So when we would come back to the app at another time, our all time scores would still be good. Then we're going to update the scoreboard. Then we're going to update the winner message. And then we're going to also display the computer choice that was chosen for the current game before we go to a new one. And of course this all happens so fast that we could put the display the computer choice in another area and all of these are kind of housekeeping things with updating the scores. So we'll save that list and we'll tackle these one at a time. And the first one being update aria result. And here we pass in the action message and the winner copy the name of this function, go ahead and scroll down to be just underneath the display action message, and we'll define this, and we pass in, let's call this the result now, it is the action message, but I'll just give it a shorter name here, and so we'll have aria result equal to document.get element by ID and this will be the play again button. So this is where the message will get sent and then when the button gets focused the message will be read and we'll say when message equals this is a ternary statement and I'll put it on separate lines so it's a little easier to follow because it's also a chained ternary. If the winner equals player then on this line is what we'll do if the winner equals player and the message will be Congratulations, you are the winner. But if it is not, then in a chain ternary, this is where you do another comparison. So then we'll compare the winner equal to computer. And if it is computer, we'll say the computer is the winner. And then if it is not, we won't say anything else. And now let's back up over here to about the line equal with the const. There it is. And we'll say aria result, which is what we defined up above. And then we'll set the aria label. We'll set this equal to a template literal. And we'll say result. And let's give it a space. And here we'll say win message. We'll give that another space and we'll say click or press enter to play again. Because this is on the button that would actually show us uh, the opportunity to play again, but it will read the winning message when it appears because it will get the focus. Okay, with that defined, we can quickly check our list. And the next thing we need to do is update the score state. So we will go ahead and call that by saying update score state, which needs to receive the winner as a parameter. And we'll copy that function name. Scroll back down. And we'll define 
update score state and pass in the winner. Now with update score state, we need to say if the winner is equal to a tie, we just want to return. There's nothing to update at that point. But then with a ternary statement, we can say if the winner equals computer, then call the method on the game object that the computer wins. But if it's not, then call the method on the object that player one wins. Oh, that is a capital there. And we save that, and so then the score state would be updated. And if you remember, in the list right after that was update persistent data, so let's go ahead and just do this, and then we'll add the function back to the list. So let's say update persistent data. And here we'll pass in the winner once again. And here we'll define a variable named store. And we're going to set this equal to the result of a ternary. And here we'll say winner equals computer. And if so, this will be CP all time. So we're getting the store name. And then if not, it's P1 all time. And then we're getting a score variable and well, we're defining a score variable. We'll say the winner equals, once again, computer. We'll call game.getCP all time. And then if it's not, we'll say game.getP1 all time. So we get the right value and then we'll go to local storage and we'll set the item and we'll pass in the store name and the score we've defined. So if the computer won, then we'll be grabbing the store name CP all time and we'll be passing in the value that we get from CP all time. So we're updating that storage. And if the player one wins, we're grabbing that store and updating the value there. So that is our update persistent data function. We can come back up here and add it as well. And it also receives the winner. So we can remove these notes. And now we're ready to update the scoreboard and it actually doesn't receive any parameter whatsoever. And now we're ready to update the scoreboard. And if you remember, this is a function we already defined. It doesn't receive a parameter, but we used it earlier in the tutorial. And if we scroll back up, it's one of the very first functions we did. It's where we reset the, the whole scoreboard and gave it the uh, proper ARIA labels. So now it just gets the proper values passed once again to the scoreboard. And let's find that function again. Here we are. So we can remove the update scoreboard note. And now we're down to the final two items we need to take care of. Update the winner message and display the computer choice. So the update winner message does receive the winner. And while we're here, I'll just delete this. I'll also say the computer choice is display computer choice and it receives the computer choice. So the final two functions to define, we'll scroll down to underneath our update persistent data function that we put together and we'll define this one. And this is update winner message, it receives the winner And now this is the message that will actually be seen on the screen. So we'll say if winner equals tie, not time, tie, we once again return. There's really nothing to report there. And now we'll define our message and we'll use a ternary to do that. So we'll say the winner is equal to the computer 
then we should want this to happen. And I'm going to paste something in because I'm using a couple of emojis. If you go to emojipedia.com, you can find all kinds of emojis, and I believe that's where I got these. So we'll say computer wins, and we've got a couple of uh, computer player emojis there. And then if not, we're going to get the message for the user. And here, once again, I'm using some emojis. You can look those up, I believe, once again, at emojipedia.com. So then you win if the computer doesn't win. After that, we need to go ahead and put this message on display. So we grab the P1 message area, which is the player one chooses area. We'll set that equal to document.get element by ID, and we'll grab that P1 message area, and then we'll say P1 message.text content is equal to the message we defined. And now the final function to create is not long at all. It is const display computer choice. And we pass in the choice. It was the computer choice above. We'll just call it choice here. And we'll grab the square that it goes in. And that is document.get element. Ah, there we go. By ID. And we want the CP underscore paper uh, container. And that's because it's right here in the middle for the computer choice. I'll scroll up just a little bit. And then we'll call our create game image function, which is a function we've already defined. We pass in the element and then we pass in, or we pass in the choice actually, then we pass in the element. So the choice is whatever choice the computer made, and then we pass in the element. So it's going to put in the image of whichever choice the computer had randomly made. And we can save that, and our game should be good to go. Let's check it out. And the computer won our first game. All time is updated, and the session is updated. Let's play again. I can see one problem we have. We only have two options showing down here. So let's click this. And now we have a problem because something wasn't there so it couldn't remove the null error. So we've got a problem to find somewhere in the code. Okay, after a little trial and error, I think I found the error. So probably more error than trial. Uh, if we scroll up, around line one, I guess I went past it, line 160, line 161. I didn't type player correctly. I typed player er. So that's in here twice somehow. So if we select both of those, just get rid of the er, the extra er at the end of player choice there. Go ahead and save both of those. And then there's one other typo that I have that was even just a little harder for me to catch. And this is during the reset board function. Here, I've got an extra S in scissors. And that definitely keeps us from creating that third image here. So let's go ahead and save that as well. And now we can try out our application again and see if all works as expected. So far, so good. Let's play again. We have a broken image because we have a third S over here as well when we were passing scissors into the create game image. Let's save that and let's give this another shot. It's a tie game. Is the computer always picking scissors? Apparently so. I think there might be some work to do there. No, it's not. There it chose paper. For a second I thought we were getting nothing but scissors from the computer, but apparently it is good. And there we've got paper again. Let's try rock. And the computer actually won that time. So yes, everything there seems to be working good. So let's test the accessibility next. 
Okay, to test the accessibility, we're going to go ahead and expand Chrome and we're going to break out of the DevTools window and use the full page. There we go, let's reload just to make sure everything's loaded as we expect it to be. That's all good, so what you want to do is go to the three dots in your top right, go to More Tools and Extensions. From there, if you already have it, you're going to enable the screen reader, which is called Chrome Vox. If not, you're going to want to search. Alert. And it's already reading to us. So I'll disable it temporarily. And I believe this is store.chrome. If I could spell Chrome, is it dot web? Chrome Web Store, chrome.google.com. From there, you want to search for Chrome Vox. There it is. And you can grab the screen reader and install it for free as an extension for Chrome. That said, I'm going to go back and enable the screen reader. Window rock, pa rock paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, heading one. Skip scoreboard, internal link. There's our skip link. I won't use it right now. I'll go through the scoreboard. Section, player one has seven all-time wins. Notice, Section. Notice the inverted colors on the highlighted score. Computer player has seven all-time wins. Player one has zero wins this session. Computer player has zero wins this session. Section, player one chooses. Heading two. Select rock. Select the paper. Select scissors. And I'll press enter. Select scissors. Scissors cuts paper. Congratulations. You are the winner. Click or press enter to play again. Button. And all of the accessibility messages are working as expected. We'll play again. Section. Player one chooses. Heading two. And our focus went directly to the player one chooses area. That's great. I'm going to tab backwards, holding down the shift and then tab. Section. Computer player has zero wins this session. Player one has one wins this session. Computer player has seven all-time wins. Player one has eight all-time wins. Skip scoreboard. Internal link. And now I'll try the skip scoreboard link by pressing enter right now. Section. Player one chooses. Heading two. And that works as expected. It went directly to the player one chooses area. Select rock. And I'll press enter. Select rock. Rock smashes scissors. Congratulations. You are the winner. Click or press enter to play again. Button. And that's great. Everything is working as expected. So today we have built an application that works in mobile view, works on desktop, works on tablets, and it is accessible for screen readers and for keyboard navigation. So you have built an ultimate rock, paper, scissors. Congratulations. It has persistent data. It works with HTML, uh, compiled CSS, and vanilla JavaScript. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing. I appreciate the support and I look forward to your comments every week. So please leave me a comment below and I'll talk to you guys again very soon.